them uh, together. In the Quranic verse that appears from the Baqarah 230 38, uh, of course all of you know how to read uh, the Arabic, uh, the English is for those who don't know it, and simply says, حَافِذُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ now that concept of the Salat al-Wusta caused a whole lot of commentaries among the Mufassirin and of course the, the most important uh, 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 facts that we all know that for a practicing Muslim you have the five daily Muslim prayers and the most uh, commonly accepted interpretation of the Salat al-Wusta is that, that you have the two earlier Salats, that of the Fajr and the Dhuhr and then the Asr is the third and of course two after it. So if you have two prayers in the morning, two prayers in the evening, it is this one in the middle that would probably interpret the word wusta correctly. So this Salat al-Asr becomes the focal point. The other times of prayers are easily uh, determinable, but the, uh, the, uh, the Asr prayer becomes a little bit more intriguing because of the following phenomena. When the Muslim community was still in Mecca, and here I have the map for you so that you could see. I hope you can see it from here. Yeah. That's where Mecca is. And the latitude is about 21 degrees and 43 minutes in here. And in that area here, it was easy to define the Salat al-Asr as the time when the shadow of a human being is equal to his height or her height to the time when the shadow is equal to twice the height. So that definition that applied in the area of Mecca would actually work and might even work all the way till about Medina where you get to the Tropic of Capricorn which is about 23 degrees and a half. We will revisit that 23 degrees and a half. Beyond that, by the time you get to Damascus, and the Muslims got to Damascus very quickly by the way, by 634, 635 uh, of the Christian era, they were here. by that time you will find that there will be many, many days during the year, especially around the winter solstice, where the shadow will never be equal to the human height. It will always be much longer. And during the winter time, as you will see in a little while also, the rays of the sun are much lower on the horizon and hence the shadow will extend too far. Does that mean when you reach the Damascus you stop the Salat al-Asr? So what do you do? Then the definition was ameliorated. In other words, the, the religion reacted to the conditions on the ground, to the mathematical geography, and the scientists also reacted to the religion. And they said the definition now should be that we will take it to mean that whatever was the shadow at noon, plus the height of the person, to the time, whatever the shadow was equal at noon, to twice the height of that person. So we will include here this, this constant, well, this variable, uh, which is the shadow of the uh, uh, at noon, and hence we can add to it whatever we want from there on. So this way it will guarantee that no matter where you are on the globe, you will be able to pray within the limits of the shadow of one person's height to twice the shadow of that. But that immediately created a problem. What is the shadow of the sun, of the, of the gnomon, uh, at noon? What is the, the length of that shadow? And as you can see, very quickly, if you take that sentence seriously, the Salat is, is such a simple, direct order. It says pray. <laughs> but the pray under those conditions. But the minute you tie it to shadows, you are tying it already to astronomical phenomena and to mathematical geography. Now you can see very quickly, to be able to define the length of the shadow at noon, you drop in here to find the equation, and now you have the length of the, uh, of the person times the cotangent of the height of the sun at noon. First thing, there is no cotangent in the Greek scientific tradition. Okay? The trigonometry of the whole Greek scientific tradition depends only on one theorem, which is the Menelaus theorem, and it does not include such concepts as time, cosines, tangents, cotangents, and the likes. So the scientists who first tried to expand the definition of the height of the sun at noon and the length of the shadow had to create this new function that is called the cotangent. So from the very beginning you see the scientists responding already by creating new science to be able to do that. Then the height of the sun at noon itself is actually a phenomenon that we know how to compute it 
It is the complement of the latitude of wherever you are on the earth, and that means it's dependent on the city that you live on, plus the decline or minus the declination of the sun on that day. You are already involved in very sophisticated mathematical astronomy from the very beginning to just know when am I going to pray? That simple Asr prayer, okay? But you are commanded to do it. Okay, it, let me explain it a little bit so that you'll understand what, what it entails. Once you begin to take these things seriously, the consequences of them become extremely important. Now, we know that the sun moves on this ecliptic, which is the dark circle that we see it in here, and from day to day, the sun supposedly caught at this point here, it revolves all around in 24 hours. So as a result, the sun will describe a shadow at noon, cast from here over there, and it will give us this angle H, H sub n here, which is the height of the sun at noon. But we notice that from day to day this, uh, this height changes, because the next day the sun is going to be here, and hence you have a different, a different height. Also, we notice that this angle that is between the equator, as you see it there, and the ecliptic, this epsilon angle here, is a fixed value meaning the inclination of the ecliptic is a fixed value. And hence, now when we look at the angle delta, that is the, the variation in the declination of the sun on daily basis, then you will see that this formula here really depends on two, meaning the height of the sun at noon, on two other variables. One of them can be easily determined by direct observation, which we can see it from here. Anywhere you are, the height of the North Pole over your local horizon is the latitude of your city. The complement of that, meaning up to 90 degrees, is the so-called phi bar. This you observe it once, you make that determination, from there on, the only variable that remains is delta. You need to know from day to day how much is the, the distance between the equator and the circle of the sun, this delta measurement that reaches a maximum here and becomes epsilon as we have. Of course, now we have a triangle that has the longitude of the sun. The sun moves day to day on this and hence creates a small delta here, a bigger delta there, and the maximum delta over here. This is the fixed epsilon in here. To solve for delta, we have to resort to this equation, which says the sine of delta is equal to sine of lambda uh, multiplied by the sine of epsilon, which now comes from where? It comes from a law that we now refer to as the sine law. Again, there is no sine law in the Greek tradition. There is no sine law in the Indian tradition from which the Arabic Islamic civilization drew a, a lot of, uh, of its uh, scientific material. So here again, we have the scientists within the Islamic civilization creating new trigonometric laws to be able to solve for this variable delta which is the very easy, the, as you, 